you. Hallelujah. We are so blessed to be with you tonight. I'm Pastor Tuck. Welcome to Spiritual Growth and Development. I'm so excited tonight. We're about to do something different. Uh, Pastor Stephanie is not here with me tonight, but uh, I praise God because I have a special guest that's going to come up. And like I said, we pray you get blessed tonight by what we're going to share with you tonight. Uh, so go ahead and get your Bibles, get your pad, get your pen, your highlighters, because we're going to get deep like we normally do. But I'm so excited about my guest who's going to join me tonight. You know, as many of you may or may not know, like I said, uh, I'm, a, I'm not only a pastor, but I'm an author. And uh, my first book was called Damaged Goods, The Restoring Power of the Father's Love. Like I said, and uh, it's a book that's written for women who've been verbally, physically, and sexually abused, emotionally. Uh, and then my second book is The Two Shall Become One Flesh, which is a book that my wife and I put together together uh, about marriage. And so it's the uh, what every couple needs to know before and after they say I do. And it's an awesome marriage manual. So many people say that marriage doesn't come with a manual. Well, now it does. You know, but we've we, we wrote those books some years ago. And my next guest is also an author. You know, he's not only an author, but, you know, he's one of my good friends. He I've known him for well over 25 years. He was one of my mentors in college. As a matter of fact, uh, he's one of my fraternity brothers. I had the privilege of him being my assistant dean of pledges when I joined the most noble clan of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated over 25 years ago. And uh, he's an awesome man of God. He's known me back BC before Christ, before I was ever saved. And uh, a few years ago, he released his first book called Do You See What I'm Saying? The Journey to Your Destiny Through Vision and the Spoken Word. And this book was so powerful when I read it that I bought copies for my entire congregation and shared it with them because it's truly a life-changing book. But uh, a couple of months ago, I had the privilege. He reached out to me and told me that he was working on his second book and he was about to release it. And I had the privilege of writing the foreword to his second book. And so that book is called Silly Women, simple-minded men, and good girls with bad names. Yeah, y'all heard what I said. The, the title is Silly Women, Simple-Minded Men, and Good Girls with Bad Names. And the title alone had me hooked. I was like, yeah, I got to read that. And so he said it to me. And when I read the book, I'm telling you, it is absolutely phenomenal. And the book's about to be released in a couple of weeks. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to have my good friend, Dr. Jeff L. Claude, to come on with me and share with us some teaching from that book. And so you all can get an understanding of what this book is about and just talk some more about this subject, this subject matter. So right now I'm going to go ahead and bring my good friend, Dr. Claude, in from the green room. Dr. Claude. Hey, hey, Pastor. God bless you. How you doing, sir? Doing great. Doing great. Good to be a part of your um part of your uh, platform. It's an awesome opportunity, and I thank God for you and, and that you're allowing God to let you steward over this, and thank you for letting me be a part of it. Oh, praise God, man. We're so excited, man. Uh, you know, as I was telling the people just now, when I when when I, when I saw your email and saw the title of the book, I was excited. I said, man, I said, and I was honored that you asked me to write the forward, but I'm going to tell you the truth, man, to be honest, and, and playing with you, man, just to tell you straight up, I say, you know, from the, if you remember in the movie, Jerry Maguire, he told me, he said, you had me at hello. You had, <laughs> yes, you, you had me at the dedication, man, because oh. the words you wrote and spoke over your daughter embodied the way I feel about my two daughters. And I know your princess is a lot younger, but you know, I got a 17 year old and, uh, about to be 18 and a 20 year old about to be 21. And, mm -hmm. but to hear those words and to read those words that you wrote to them, it really shook me because 
I said, this man feels about his daughters the way I feel about mine. And I know we've had conversations about that before, but I'm telling you, when I read that dedication, it just shook me. And it kept that, that theme just took me through the entire book. And I was like, I just can't wait till this book comes out. You know, I've been worrying you. I keep sending emails. I'm like, hey, man, when is going to drop? Because I want my daughters to read this book so bad. And I'm so excited about it. It's a great book for young men and young women. And so I'm just excited. So I'm going to get out of the way. I want you to go ahead and, you know, start this conversation because I want you to be able to share with the people what this is about. Because I'm telling you, this is a, this is a life-changing book. Thank you, uh, first of all, Pastor. I, I truly appreciate those uh, kind words and, and just your humble spirit and being willing to, uh, one, take my offer and read the book and, and be able to give me some feedback and, and get and forward uh, the book. I do not take uh, any of those things for granted. Uh, anytime God gives you stewardship over anything, you want to be a good steward of it. And Amen. You have been a good steward over your ministry and even this platform here. And so me being on this platform and you reading my book and being able to write the forward, it says I honor you and I respect you and I want to say thank you. Uh, but just mentioning uh, the piece where you said I had you at the dedication. Uh, yes, because the dedication, as you alluded to, I dedicated the book uh, to my daughter. I dedicated it to my daughter. And some may ask with such a title, why would you dedicate uh, your book to your child, especially your child being a female? Because uh, it's easy to get the mindset that I'm attacking or I'm belittling uh, one sex or the other, male and or female. And so then to write a dedication to your daughter, some will question that unless they read and get some insight. And basically the foundation, one of the foundational reasons that I dedicated this book to my daughter is because I wanted to put something in place that she doesn't have to walk down certain paths that I walk, and that she doesn't have to experience certain things that people who were uh, who had levels of relationships with me experienced. There were different females and different people that I have come in contact with that, because of my decisions and my way of thinking at the time, I affected their life in such a negative way that it left a lasting impression. And that, and if, if not by the grace of God, it could go on generation to generation. And so my goal for dedicating the book to her was to say, look, daddy's not perfect. Uh, daddy has not always dotted all his I's and crossed all his T's. And even now, I may not dot all my I's and cross all my T's, but hopefully I'm dotting more and crossing more than I have ever before. But I wanted to make sure that she whenever she becomes of age and able to read it, this information and, and really take it in that she can say, man, my dad was a man of valor. My, man, my dad was a man who had a level of courage to put himself out there. My dad was somebody who loved me enough to try to protect me, but also loved me enough to give me insight and wisdom and tell me the truth. So that's, that's why uh, I dedicated the book to my, my daughter. I wanted to, one, if she does make some mistakes because she's human, and she and it's a strong possibility. It's just by the numbers she's going to make them. But when she does, she have a guy. She has a guy. In addition, of course, to the Word of God, in which I use scriptural principles throughout the book to help guide anyone who reads it, especially her. And you know, it's funny you said that because most people don't realize it. I said, but I know that's the true heart of a father. You know, our job is to try to put as many safeguards in place to make their lives better than even ours were. And like I said, when you said that, like, so it just rang so familiar with me because I remember when writing Damaged Goods, I was like, I, I want my daughters to have all of this information. I want them to be able to avoid these pitfalls. I want them to be able to see this stuff so that they don't have to experience some of the things, like you said, that, you know, other people have experienced even at my hand. And like I said, and just so that they will be able to have the life that God wants them to have. And that's 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 the heart of a shepherd. And that's who, who we are as men of God. Like I said, as fathers, that's our job is to shepherd our homes. And so, like I said, man, once again, I applaud you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And just even just talking about the book in itself, um, one of my main intents is to help anyone that reads it, male or female, to understand that you are not your worst decision. 
Mm-hmm. And I had to come to that realization myself as I read, wrote the book and as I meditated and prayed and, and as the years have gone and I've grown and allowed levels of uh, situations to mature me, I have to come to an understanding that I am not and those that I minister to and those that I meet, I'll help them to see you are not your worst decision. That labels are just that. They are labels. These are perceptions that people may try to attach to you for many different reasons. And many times it's not because they are thinking highly, it's because of the le- how low they think of themselves. So mm-hmm. they attach certain things to you based on where they are. And so the title sometimes is a little edgy and I meant for it to be edgy. I meant for it to be in your face because I wanted to get someone's attention to say, look, some things are silly. Some things are not thinking the thing, the process. To be. Some things uh, do take us to a place of being simple minded where you're not acting according to what you've been taught and according to what you know. Because there's a difference between being a person that's a silly or a simple minded man or a silly woman. There's a difference between that and being what I call a worm. Mm-hmm. We'll get into it in a second. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 through 7, it talks about how the worm would, uh, he's talking about men and he's talking about ministers and teachers who are trying to get into people's lives. And I took it into the direction of how men. And, and you can also for females, but I'm mostly talking about men, how they kind of creep and worm their way into weak-minded people's lives. And mm-hmm. how worm, the difference between a simple-minded man or a broken man and a, a worm is a simple-minded person doesn't know, mm-hmm. hasn't been taught, doesn't mm-hmm. have anything to pull from. But a worm knows what they're doing, and they do it for the simple reason to take advantage, to get to not to have to have any standards because one of the characteristics and one of the things that if you do some study about a worm, a worm doesn't have eyes, a worm doesn't have a backbone, a worm doesn't have legs. Wow. Which could easily talk about how a worm doesn't have eyes, meaning where is your vision? Mm-hmm. Where's your ability to foresee? Not just your sight, because vision is more important than sight. And so when you understand sight is what I can see physically, vision is what I can see in spirit. And what is in the spirit is more real than what is in the natural because it had to be in the spirit before it can come into the natural. So my thing, I want anybody that reads this book to know that yes, we all are gonna fall into one of those categories at some point in our life. You're gonna be that silly woman. You're gonna be that simple-minded man. You may even be that good girl with a bad name. It's another type of a topic that's in my book that talks about man or beast, how you can be a predator and a prey at the same time or vice versa. And so I'm here to let people know you may have certain labels or certain behaviors that fit certain labels, but that doesn't make you what that worm is. There's a difference. I don't want, my goal is to prevent people from making decisions being with worms. Whether that worm is a female or whether that worm is a male. I want you, yes, you may end up marrying a person who acts silly sometimes, but when they get the knowledge, and when they get the information and they get the truth, the truth will set them free and they take it and act on it. Then they don't continue in that behavior because I can clearly say that I've been a simple minded man. Yeah, I can clearly say that I've done things that I didn't know. But I also can clearly say, especially prior to salvation, that I had the opportunity to be a worm. And so and mm-hmm. that worm was that because I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was doing was wrong, but because it benefited me and benefited what I wanted at the time, I took advantage of people who may not have known. And so God had a way of humbling me when I gave my life to Christ. He had a way of bringing a level of repentance and humility to say, wait a minute, work on you first. Allow me to heal and work on you. But I'm going to, at some stage and at some point, I'm going to give you a platform that you can share and help somebody else. Because sometimes it can be more damaging to success too early. It's just like premature, having a baby premature. Mm-hmm. Success without proper grooming and mature, becoming mature and reaching levels of influence and platform without having those things in place. You can have, it can be premature, just like having a baby prematurely. Having, doing that is not always a blessing. 
sometimes None. it could potentially lead to premature death. Yep. So, so me, this book, actually, when I wrote this book, I first preached on this particular topic. I can't even remember the year now, but it's been at least 10 years ago. And wow. so 10 plus, 10 plus years ago, God gave me this word. And I thought this was going to be my first book. But God, I still needed some more work. I still wow. needed some more work. And I had the doc, I had the theory in place. I had the biblical scriptures in place, but did I have the lifestyle and the maturity in place? Wow. And God has allowed me to get to a place I thank God for it, that I feel like He trusts me enough to say, yes, I'm still gonna keep working on you, but you're ready. You're ready now that you can take what comes with being exposed. You can take what comes with your level of influence. You can take what comes with your ability to reach the masses because as many people as you can help is also as many people you can hurt. So if you don't respect the fact of who you about to help, that you can also hurt them, then you would then come out and be brash and be rude and be abrasive and, and kill somebody's spirit, even though you're trying to save somebody's soul. And so I didn't want, and I thank God, thank God that he didn't allow me to get to this stage where I'm pushing this book out and that I come out and kill people worse than where they already are. Mm. Take them lower than where they've already experienced. Versus me saying, look, yes, this is where you are. This may have been where you were. This may be the road that you're traveling. But guess what? There is hope. Uh, there is hope. So um, I know I got a little going on that one, Pastor, but I no, just you want you to know that's, that's my passion. That's where it came from. Uh, that you're not your worst decision and that label for just that, they are labeled. And that, uh, and another piece, and I'll hit it in a minute, but I want to give you the opportunity to say something, share anything. But it, it, a lot of it has to do with, for me, had to do with trauma. Had to do with trauma, early childhood trauma. Early childhood trauma tends to affect your life and affect those that you have contact and that you have relationships with in life. And so now, you may date someone, marry someone, or just have a, a, a casual relationship with someone. But because you've had certain levels of complex trauma, uh, where, and when I say complex trauma, that means trauma that consistently happens uh, over and over again uh, from different people, especially people that you care about and love, that how sometimes now, not only is it affecting you, but it affects those that are you love. And then that goes into, if we talk in spiritual and talking. What, how we talk in the church. We talk about generational curses and, and mm -hmm. confronting your daddy devil um, and understanding that there's some cycles that you want to break versus some that you want to keep going. So those are some of the things that uh, I talk about and that we dig, dig into in this book. Uh, so I'm looking forward to you giving some feedback, but also those that will read the book, understanding and growing, and then us continuing to grow from what this book is teaching. You know, like you said, that's 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 some powerful stuff because, you know, as I mentioned, even in the forward, you know, I, I've, I've encountered a lot of people, like I said, who've been mistreated, like you said, been through trauma in different manners, like you said, whether it's verbally, physically, sexually. And they all, it always results in an emotional wound that they carry with them and creates that mental scarring that affects our decision making. It, it, it affects the things that we do going forward. And if we don't deal with those things, like you said, it, it sets in a pattern. And like you yeah. said, that's where a lot of those things come from. And so many people don't realize that, you know, it, it, it can cause low self-esteem, self-destructive behavior, poor choices, you know, unhealthy relationships and all of these things because of some of these things that have happened to them. And like you said, that, 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 like I said, it, it was so amazing to me, like I said, to see, and I, I told you this personally, I said, but it looked like your book picked up where damaged goods left off. I told you, if we can find a way to link them together, that would be the yeah. perfect combination of books because it, it, it looked like they were literally meant to be together because we both have similar backgrounds, similar situations, and God gave me a perspective to get them to a certain place. And like I said, it looked like you're taking them on to a whole nother level of dealing with those mentalities, like I said, and going deeper in those mentalities to help them understand even more so how they got into that position. 
and and like I said, and how to how to avoid going further than that. And like I said, it, it's such a powerful thing for for people to to be able to get through that because so many people don't recognize this. And this is something my wife and I we talk about all the time when we see adults who are still going through things, and they're going through things from their childhood. And that's why parenting is such a big thing for us because there's so many kids that are suffering from the decisions that their parents made. And right. we don't realize that. And, and, and that's why I'm a, we're, you know, it's one of our big things is, you know, marital counseling and, you know, teaching people about parenting because when we're selfish and we make decisions and don't think about how those decisions are going to affect our children, now our children are going to have to live with those into adulthood. And like you said, that's how these generational curses get started. But I always say the one way to break a generational curse is by making a different decision than your father did or your mother did. All you got to do is make a different decision to break that cycle because that's how they got on that path was they made a choice. And we just got to make a different one. Hey, man, you, you, you hit it right on the head. And, you know, I, I often say that you don't know how damaged someone is until you attempt to repair them with love. Wow. If you don't know how damaged a person is, until you attempt to repair them with love. And, and that's how you recognize if a person has, I would call deep ingrained hurt, deep ingrained pain, that you come with love and now you get something opposite than love back. Because when you sow love, you should read love back. Mm -hmm. But because of the, the deep depth of pain and the depth of hurt, a lot of times, person that has experienced it, they don't perceive love for what love really is. And, and they misinterpret what real love is. And so it's just it's just a serious thing and you hit that on the head and that you can't. And another thing that I think about as I listen to what you just said is that you cannot find peace until you find all the peace. Wow. That you cannot right. find peace until you find all the pieces. And then as I thought about that, but that was a saying I said, and then today, as I was meditating today, uh, and I'm gonna look at what I wrote, I said, you cannot find true peace though until you find the peace giver. Wow. So that one piece is from a human human point of view, but you can't find peace until you find all the pieces. So that's why people go on to ancestry.com and that's why they want to do their uh their history, which is fine and perfect. And I agree, I, I want to know my history, but you're trying to find the pieces. What got you here? What made you? What made this person make that decision? What influenced them and do all that? And so sometimes you feel like you can't have two true pieces. You find all the pieces, but as God helped me to take it a step further, is that you can't find true peace. I added the word true there. True peace until you find the peace giver, because sometimes you may never find certain pieces, mm -hmm. but the peace giver. That's why he promises in his word that I will give you peace that passes all understanding. Yep. And so you can't even understand why you have peace when you've gone through what you've gone through. You can't understand why you can have forgiveness when you've done what you've done and experienced what you've experienced. So even in this book, silly women, simple minded men, and good girls with bad names, they are people that don't have peace. And my mission is to help them find the pieces and to help them find the peace giver. That's my mission. Help them find the pieces and help them find the peace giver. That's one of my goals. You see where I'm coming from, Pastor? Oh yeah. You know, and it's and it's and it's crazy because some people have been led to believe that you can't you can't move on, you can't forgive until you address, you know, the people who hurt you and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes you don't get that opportunity. Like I said, and, and that's the thing about it. And and one of the things that I tell people all the time, you have to recognize this the person who hurts you especially if you're not still in relationship with them. That person hurt you and they moved on to either hurt somebody else or go on about their business. They ain't even thinking about you no more. But you're mm -hmm. stuck in that place of hurt. And so you're the only one that can set yourself free. They've mm -hmm. literally left you there in that hurt room and they going on about their business. And that's why, like I said, you got it. Jesus is the only one that can get you out of that. Because if you're trying to figure out why did they do it, you know, you know, this and that you're trying to go back and deal with them and, and make them apologize and, 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 you know, and pay restitution for that's not always that's not always possible. So sometimes you're just you're going to be stuck 
if you don't. Mm -hmm. And that's why it always has to come from the Lord. But you know, uh, one, one of the things, and I know people, people are probably wondering this, uh, show them how you came to this name. And you know, because I know it sounds crazy to people, but they don't realize all of it's biblical. It all is biblical. Uh, every word, <laughs> everything that we talk about, it's all come from a biblical uh, standpoint and principle. If you go with me uh, to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 6, uh, and, and it would be wise to read the verses prior to that. Uh, but I'm going to read it. It says, for among them are those who worm, which means to creep, their way into the home and captivate, bewitch, hypnotize, and seduce silly, weak natured, and spiritually dwarfed women, loaded down with burden of their sins, meaning their own evil desires, and easily swayed and led away by various evil desires and seductive impulses. These weak, silly, women will listen to anybody who would teach them they are forever inquiring and getting information but are never able to arrive at the recognition and knowledge of truth so that's that's how i came up with one portion of it mm -hmm. but then the portion because we got to head down not yep. just about that silly woman if you go with me to proverbs chapter seven uh it talks about the simple-minded man. Mm -hmm. And it says in chapter 7, and you can read verse 6 and 7 and then skip down to verses 21 through 26. It talks about, I was looking out the window of my house one day and saw a simple-minded young man who lacked common sense. Wow. Let me read that again. Wow. I was looking out my house one day and saw a simple-minded young man who lacked common sense. Remember, Proverbs is, is what, the book of wisdom? Yes. Uh, one of the books of, one of, the yes. books of wisdom? Yes. Uh, she seduced him with her pretty speech. With her flattery, she enticed him. He followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter or like a trapped bird awaiting an arrow that will pierce its heart. Listen, he's, he's walking into death and don't even know it. Listen, because he's simple-minded. Listen to me, my sons. That's what the scripture says. Listen to me, my son. Pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray away towards her. For she has been the ruin of men. Numerous men have been her victim. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den to death. So those scriptures alone, and it's more, but those two sections of scriptures played a key role in me coming up with this title because I, I, I saw the piece where it talked about the silly women. Then I saw in Proverbs where they talked about the simple-minded men. And I know you can interchange either one. It doesn't, even in the one in Proverbs where it's talking about how she led him, but it can be the opposite way where he's leading her. So, but of course, in this particular scripture, they identify the characters, male and female, but Trust me, it can go both ways, but that's how I came up with it. And that's where it came from. And, and I said, well, if, if the word said it, it is so. And then I saw myself walking down that street and not knowing that I was being led into the swamp. And I saw other people doing that. They're, and I, I'm gonna let you talk in a second, Pastor. But one of the chapters in the book talks about uh, laying in the lap of death. Laying in the lap or either sitting in the lap of death. And that scripture, along with me reading about Samson, who laid his head in Delilah's lap and yep. she cut his yep. hair. Between those two scriptures helped me come up with laying your head in the lap of death. And sometimes we can put our head, and I have done it. I've laid my head in people's lap and I was, I was getting myself to a spiritual and an emotional death. But not only that, there were some people who laid their head in my lap. And because they was laying their head in my lap and they became vulnerable because they let their guards down, now they were being led to death spiritually and emotionally. And it could even go all the way to physical. Because if you look at Samson, 
it wasn't just a spiritual and, and a visual death. It ultimately led to his physical death. It, it and cost so him life. It, it cost him his life, just like this scripture said that he was walking down, not knowing he was about to have the arrows uh, pierce his heart. So that's how I came up with the title. That's where it came. That's the root of it. And then, of course, I did more research and more um, self-evaluation and research in the scripture to make sure that I wasn't taking someone down a path that didn't have spiritual principles. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing because when you talk about that simple minded woman and like I said, and like I said, I mean, this, this, this silly woman. And you talk about the fact that she's being basically taken advantage of because she's emotionally and spiritually weakened. She's in a bad place. She, it says she's overburdened with, with sin and diverse lust, basically because of guilt. And like you said, that trauma plays a place in that. You've got a lot of women who've been, whether they've been verbally, physically, sexually abused, and now, like I said, they fall into that category, what I call damage. And like I said, they become these silly women. And so now guys who are now predators now see that and are able to manipulate that. Because when a woman, and this is this is one of the things where I talk to my me and my wife, we talk to our kids all the time. You know, we watch TV, we'll see this, and, and I and I I'll, I'll even pause the TV where we watch, and I'm like, y'all see, she's about to make herself vulnerable to be taken advantage of because of her behavior, because of the things she's saying, because of what she's accepting from this guy. And 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 I and I have to make note of these things because I want them to be able to see these things when they come. Because like you said, when you're in that position where you're you've gotten to that place where you're laid down, laden, heavy laden with those burdens and, and 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 get to that place where you're not feeling good about yourself. Somebody can take that and manipulate it. And predators yeah. know how to find that. Predators, yeah. they know how to smell. They, they, they can smell out low self-esteem like a dog smells out fear. And yeah. and they know how to play it. They know how to play with it. They know how to give you just enough to make you feel good and then how to take it right back and snatch the carpet right out from under you just when they want to. And they know how to keep you on that ride where you're depending on them validating you. They're depending on them telling you what you need to hear so that they can get what they want out of you and they can treat you however they want. And that's what, oh, like, and that's what, and that's what he's talking about here. And then, like you said, then you look at this simple-minded young man who's now allowing his lust his flesh mm -hmm. to lead him. And mm -hmm. because of that, he's not making wise decisions. And that's why you see these guys out here, like you said, they're losing everything they got. They find themselves in situations where the violence and, and things are taking place, where a girl is taking advantage of them and they're taking all of their money. You know, they're, all these kinds of things are happening because they've put themselves in a situation where their decisions are not being led in the right way. And like you said, and it's easy to get into any of these situations if you don't understand the mentalities behind it and you don't understand how you get there. And that's why I said oh. this, this, this book is such an awesome tool because it, it opens the eyes and it prepares them so that they can start to recognize these things because anybody at any point in time can go through something and find themselves in a vulnerable spot and somebody can take a place, take advantage of your vulnerability. No question. No question. And, and the other thing to what you're saying, pastor, and that I address in the book, in addition to you being vulnerable because of trauma and because of things that happened prior to, we have to also deal with sin. Yes. And, yes. you know, how what the enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of times things don't look like sin or are not sin when you first start. Uh, and one description, I want to read it, and I know you can really feast off this. In James chapter 1, in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says, but every man is tempted. And remember, this can be man or male or female. Mm -hmm. but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own, not somebody else, of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Let me read that again. But every person, when he is drawn away, enticed, and baited, this is another version, by his own evil desire and lust and passion, then the evil desire, when it has conceived, 
gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully matured, bringeth forth death. That's from the Amplified Bible, James 1, 14 through 15. And basically, the gist that I'm trying to get to with this is some things don't start out as sin. Mm -hmm. But because you allowed yourself to continue in it, it then conceived. And when it con after it's conceived, that's why you have to watch the things you watch, the things yeah. you listen to, wow. the people you're around. Those things are so important. And I address that in the book that, look, these things don't just happen by chance. Mm -mm. What have you been watching? What have you been listening to? Who have you been around and how have they been talking? What have you been exposed to? Because it's not that be, you may not go to hell because you was with this person. You may not go to hell because you watched this show. But because you watch this show and you continue to watch the symbolisms and the and the underlying messages that are in this show and that's in this music and that's in these situations, then it is conceived. And when that thing becomes conceived, you got to eventually you got to give birth. Mm -hmm. So that thing is going to eventually start to grow. That sin now, now is going to conceive and become sin. And then when it gives birth, it gives birth to sin. And then at the time. Because sometimes you can get, people say, I've been doing this forever, but you can get away with sin for now, it looks like. But the ultimate end is death. And so the end to this behaviors and these actions is death. And I'm trying, and I mean this from the sincerity of my heart, my goal, and of course I'm talking to me too, is to prevent death. It's to prevent spiritual death. It's to lead someone to the truth. And then to lead someone to healing and, and uh, to a renewed way of thinking and a renewed mind. Because I realized that that's exactly what I needed for me. I needed that for me. I don't believe, and, and my, my experience has taught me that it's hard to get to a place where you truly understand the importance and the value of forgiveness until you need to be forgiven. Mm, say that. I said, for me, it, I came to the realization, and at least it's for me, and I believe it's for others as well, that you really do not understand the importance and the value of forgiveness until you need and want forgiveness for yourself. And when you need and want forgiveness for yourself and somebody, especially being God, graces you to forgive you, now you understand the value of forgiving others. Now you understand the value of not holding grudges and you understand how to let things drop. Because see, these things that cause people to be silly and simple minded and have these labels and to live out certain patterns, it has some underlying things that can have some underlying holding uh, grudges and offense. And if you don't get to a place where you can forgive and let drop, this thing will ultimately lead to death because that in itself it's pulling you to your own desire and your own lust, which is a strong passion. And so um, uh, that's one of the things that I thought about as you was talking. And so some people are walking dead. <clears throat> I call it dead man walking. And you're, you're walking dead and you don't even know that you're dead, but you walk in that way because of the decisions that you make. And some people wonder, Pastor, is this book just about relationships, male and female? Um, it is for the single person, it's for the married person, it's for the person who's happily single and don't want to get married but just wants to be self-fulfilled and work on some self-development. It's for the young person, it's for the older person, it's for the male, it's for the female, and uh, it's for a, a, a wide spectrum because I believe a young person, it can prevent some things. An older person, it can heal them from some things that they already did. A person middle age and middle levels of experience, it can help navigate them through decisions and hard situations that they're going to go through. So I'm hoping uh, that even tonight, us talking about it, somebody will be inspired. And not just for the simple fact of me getting a level of profit or a level of popularity because somebody bought my book, so to speak, but more so what they can gain from the book. And ultimately, the book is going to lead them back to true principles, which is the word of God. You know, and that's the thing, you know, you, you were saying that, you know, that in James, where he talks about being led away by his own lust and desires. Mm -hmm. One of the things most people don't realize is that 
Satan can't tempt you unless it's something that you want. See, he, he can't tempt you. You you can beg out. I don't care what you can find the most famous pastry chef in the world, and they can make the, the, the best German chocolate cake that you, I mean, you can ever describe. I mean, the, you can say this is the, the best German chocolate cake in the world and sitting on the table, and it was sitting there in front of me forever because I hate chocolate. Right. You couldn't tip me. You couldn't tip me with it if you tried. Uh huh. But see, coconut cake on another uh, is a whole other thing for me. You follow me? Oh, so that's a whole other story. And so you got to understand, the devil already knows what you like. Mm -hmm. And so part of being able to overcome some of these things is having this ability of self awareness. This 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 ability to know who you are, know where your where your weaknesses are. And that's why this book serves as a not only a restorative tool, but a preventative measure because it, it, it gives you the ability to see things from a biblical perspective to help you transform your thinking and to guide your decision making. And that's why I thought, like I said, it was so powerful because when you start looking at, you start breaking down some of the the mentalities that have been perpetuated through society and, you know, and, and that can only be changed by the word because some of these things we've adopted and the world has adopted and tell you that they're normal. Yes. They call the world has right adopted right sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. The world has adopted sin and will tell you that sin's okay. Mm -hmm. That it's all right to live like this. There's nothing wrong with this. Everybody's doing it. This is how you should live. But they don't see the cost of that. And you, like you said, you said that you can look like you can sin forever and don't have to pay a price. But see, sin is, sin is like student loans. They they defer they defer the payment, but they coming for their money. They're coming for it. <laughs> it, it. The payment date is coming, and just because he's fooled you by deferring the payment, you you don't realize the cost until the payments come due, and then you realize how much you're it's actually taking out of your life. And so we've yeah. got to start recognizing that. Because, you know, consequences are more important than decisions. Yes. You know, I, I don't know if anybody who's listening and watching, if they caught what I'm saying. And I'm going to say it again. Consequences are more important than decisions. The most important consequence one must consider is their memory. Mm. And see wow. what God and principles and truth tries to do is to get you to make healthy decisions based on knowing what consequences will follow. And if you understand that consequences are more important, then it will gauge and guide your decisions, which will ultimately affect your memory. So when God gives us scriptures and rules and guidelines and principles, what he's one of the things he's trying to protect us from is your memory. He's trying to say, look, there's going to be nights you won't be able to sleep because you remember what you went through. You remember what you've done. There's going to be things that's going to be flashbacks. One of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, after results of trauma and after results of experiences is sometimes you have nightmares and you have dreams and, and you have flashbacks. And so what happens, these are memories. And so the goal I'm trying to get you is how do I affect my future memory? Mm. How do I affect what you will remember when you get older? Some people get to dementia and get older and things come out that may have happened when they was a child or come out that they may really was thinking, I don't know because I'm, I'm not having experience and I wouldn't say I'm educated in that area. But a lot of that, a lot of times it's because of certain memories that have become subconscious and they have become so deep inside that you've hid when you was able to control certain things coming out. But now there's because of level limitabilities that's going on in your mind, Things come out. And so and, this, and so God is saying, even if things come out, it should be coming out a good memory if you follow my teachings and my principles. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, my, I, it's a lifesaver, I believe. I really think that people can benefit and grow because in all that I'm sharing, all that I'm sharing, of course, I have different ways of getting it across, is actually written in this book. Uh, even when it talks about consequences being more important than decisions and how decisions uh, and how God is trying to, and these principles are trying to protect your memory. Uh, because me personally, when I first gave my life to Christ and I started to have that level of repentance, 
one of the things that really affected me was my memory. Mm -hmm. I kept remembering who I hurt. I remember I used to come into the church and I would have these deep levels of um, tearing up and crying. And as they say in the old church, wailing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was, it was coming out of the hurt, one that I experienced, but in some cases, even more so of what I did because I felt bad for hurting people. And then I found myself in what I call cycles that even after I got saved and gave my life to Christ, I started, I still was doing certain things based on habit, based on practice, based on this is how it's always been done, which is called a cycle. And then I felt so bad because I'm like, God, I just want to be a good man. I just want to be a good man and I don't want to hurt nobody else. But then I keep finding myself hurting somebody else. And I'm saved now, God. I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to try. I'm living the best I know how according to what I've learned in the word of God. But I'm still hurting people. I'm still getting people. And it's not because I intend now. It's not, now I'm not worm anymore. But I'm doing it sometimes not even knowing that I'm doing it until it's too late. And when it's too late, now that person is already affected. And, and somebody taught me, they said that you are your motive. They was trying to help me heal. They said, you are your motive. If you didn't intend, then you don't have to beat yourself up so bad that you kill yourself because that's not what your motives were. And that brought a level of comfort, but it didn't totally heal me because I didn't want to just know that I didn't intend to do stuff, but yet I still kept hurting people. I wanted to not only not intend to do it, but I wanted to have such a renewed way of thinking and a new, a renewed mind that now I don't do it. Forget not intending to do it, but I just don't do it. And I do right because it's right, not because of what I'm going to get or what's going to be taken from me, but just because it's the right thing to do. When my mom was shot and killed and she died in front of me, Pastor. Uh, I was four and a half or so years old, I believe that. Uh, and I saw her laying on the ground. And as she was laying there, I finally got the courage to go over to her. And one of the last things she said to me was to be a good boy. Mm. She said, everything's going to be all right. Be a good boy. And then she passed. And imagine that memory following you the rest of your life. Here I am now, I'm mentioning it in this talk with you, and it's 30 plus years ago that this happened. That I remember her saying to me, be a good boy. So you can imagine when I start having those memories of the hurts that I caused and the hurts that I experienced, I was questioning whether I was living up to the request and the, the charge of my mom. Had I been a good boy? Am I being a good man? Am I being according to what her heart desired for me? And so this book is my way of trying to be a good man. Trying to be a good. It's my way of trying to let people know that if you can change. That you're, you're not your worst decision. And that this doesn't have to be your end. And that whatever God has for you is for you. And that in spite of what you might have said and done, that you can change by the grace and by the power of God. And not only by the power of God, which is the key component, but by help from others. Some of us are going to need some counseling and some therapy, whether it's spiritual counseling or secular counseling. Some of us are going to need just knowledge and education and history so that you can grow. When I start getting those pieces that I talked about earlier, start getting pieces, what happened in childhood, who was affected here, how that has affected me, what my daddy went through, what my mom went through, what I've experienced, how that, how am I doing some of the same things that I saw and or didn't even see? I believe there's a scripture in the book, I believe it was Isaac. Um, who basically started to walk in the same pattern of his father and wasn't even there when his father did certain things. He picked the same beautiful woman. He lied about how beautiful she was. Mm -hmm. All this, this years and generations later after his father had done the same thing, but he was following the same practice. So he was following the same cycle, but didn't even know why he was following it. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. didn't even know that he was basically needed to confront his daddy's devil. And it didn't and so happen until and it understand. didn't happen until ja didn't happen until Jacob. There you go. It went three generations deep before Jacob realized that I got to change this, that I got to break this cycle. I said I got to break this cycle. It took that long, it took that long for them to get the understanding that that's what was necessary. And so I, I know I went a different way with you, Pastor, but I, I just wanted to make sure I get that point across. Another point that we talk about in the book, we give certain examples. We give certain um, little innuendos to say, look, this could be, this could potentially be a hint that you may be walking in the direction of being silly or simple mind. So I'm going to give a couple of those things that, because my, my father always say a hint to the wise is sufficient. Yeah. A yeah. hint to the wise. So if you're wise, all I got to do is give you a hint and you're going to catch on to it. If you ain't wise, I need to tell you verbatim, go step by step. But if you got a level of wisdom, let me just throw a little hint out there. And if you take that hint, you might be okay. And if these are just some things just to consider, just to consider. You tell me what you think about them, Pastor. One who judges his manhood on how many women he can get. That's yeah. called the pimp syndrome. Oh, so man. that's one of the hints. I am a simple-minded man. I could potentially be a simple-minded man if, one, I judge my manhood by how many women I can be intimate with. And you know, that's the about thing. That. So, so much of that is one of those things, like you said, has been passed on, that has become generational. It's a learned behavior. And it's one of those things that, like you said, you don't even think it's wrong because society has told you that that's what's right. It's part of stuff, like you said, what you're looking at, what you're listening to. And the Bible says, guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life. This is the stuff that actually you have picked up. And like I said, and, and, and like I said, you and I both know we, we, we fell prey to that. We, 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 we ate it from, like I said, those around us, from the things we were listening to, the things we were watching. And that's how you end up in that path. And of being simple-minded, and then you recognize at one point, wait a minute, something's wrong with my thinking. And like you said, and 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 it's like so many people are still stuck in that place. And the sad thing is, it's so dangerous because just like the young man that the Bible describes, talking about him following her and going down to her bed and everything, that all sounds very pleasurable. But like you said, at a certain point, the price is going to come due. And we don't recognize that. And that's where we get stuck. But, yeah, that's that's definitely an indicator because society has even made us, like I so said, we even use those words as if they're positive. Words. Oh, boy, he pimping. You know, oh, he a pimp. And like I said, mm -hmm. a pimp was never anything good. He was a man that sold women and beat women. Where was that a good thing at? Exactly. Exactly. So what we, what we, what is supposed technically is wrong. We don't call right, you know. And yeah. anything that we continue to call right long enough becomes a part of law, mm -hmm. part of our society. Long enough, they make it in law. But let's go to a couple more, and I let you, uh, this one could be for women. A woman who believes they know too much to be had by a man. Wow. Oh, Somebody who believes they know too much to be taken advantage of or had by a man could potentially be a person who falls into that category so not saying you are not saying you're not but i'm saying just think about it yeah uh, hey, hey, hate to tell you but if that's your mentality like you said the bible says pride goes before the fall <laughs> yeah and you're, you're you're standing on a very slippery slope and a banana peel is right below your feet if that's your mentality Right. Because like you said, men are very cunning. They're very crafty. Mm -hmm. And like yeah. I said, and they and they can smell they can smell that just as well as they can smell insecurity. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Another two I'm gonna give you about two more. Uh another one, one that beats you in order to lead and or control you is an example of what a potential simple minded man is. A person and that beats you, physically beats you, mentally and or physically, 
in order to lead and or control you. Another one is dating someone you know is not yours, meaning unequally yoked, spiritually, educationally, uh, common goals and vision. If you dating someone who you know is not meant for you based on those things, then that means you're not operating in wisdom. You're not operating in, in discernment. You're operating in simple, being simple and simpleton, which is lack of knowledge. That's basically what simple is all about. It's really lack of knowledge, is not in, lack of intelligence, is basically not making common sense. So that's what we're saying. You're not making common sense when you do certain things. A couple more, and you speak on those two if you choose, um, but a couple more. Dating a married man or woman is an example of simple. If you're dating someone who you know is already married, whether that's male or female, then you now can fall into one of these categories. So how do you know? So who is that silly, uh, simple-minded man? Who is that simple-minded woman? Who is that good girl with bad ink? Ask the question, do I fall into any of these categories? Am I dating somebody that I know is married? Am I doing that? If I am, then I'm not making a, a good common sense because now I'm putting myself in a situation that can come back, not only hurt the person that I'm dealing with, but hurt me and hurt the children. It has generational um, uh, effects that come with these particular decisions. And lastly, uh, a man that allows a woman to take care of him in order to get material gain. Now, I'm not suggesting that you don't ever find yourself in a situation where the woman helps you. She may even make more money than you at certain stages in, in your life. But what I'm talking about is where you have an intent to allow a woman to take care of you only so that you can have certain gains. So you want to drive her car so that you can, but you don't want to buy your own car. You want to live in her place, but don't want to pay no rent or mortgage. You don't want to think. So those are examples of what a simple minded or a silly person would be or could potentially be. So that's just some things just to jog you. I don't want to give people too much because I don't want to, you know, I want them to read the book. But I want to give you enough to say, oh, OK, that's what he's that's what's in there. These are some things that's in that's in the book. What you think about those, Pastor? Uh, you know, you said you said some powerful things. Uh, you know, the first one I was listening to when you talked about, you know, a man beating a woman to control her. I said the Bible even says God hates a man that clothes himself with violence like he does his clothes. It, mm -hmm. it says that, that that's something God hates. And I, I I've always, even in my most foolish of days, was always leery of anything that God said he hated. I mean, when, when God specifically calls it out and says, hey, uh, this right here, I got a major problem with, because you never want to find yourself on the other side of God. So uh, the only thing I tell a man then, I said, you know, that it, it was amazing because I even talked about it in the the, the introduction or dedication to, to, to damaged goods. I talked about my wife. The thing that God showed me when I met my wife was God showed me that that was his daughter mm. and he was entrusting yes. his daughter to me mm -hmm. and I needed to be careful how I handled her yes. and it, it and it really changed how I, I saw everything but then the thing like you said it, that, that really shook me was he went and showed me he said and all the other ones that you mistreated they were mine too <laughs> yes yes Mm -hmm. Because we don't recognize that. Mm -hmm. If you remember, even with that, God said it wasn't good the man to be alone. He said, so I will make him a help me. God said, right. I gave woman to you. So this is my daughter that I entrusted to you. So we don't have the right mentality when we're mistreating them. You know, yeah. and then when you started talking about the, the, the guy who's he wants her to take care of him. He want to drive her car. He want to spend her money and all that kind of stuff. You know, I tell my daughters this all the time. I say, you don't understand. When God made Adam, before he gave him a wife, he gave him a job. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> he, he had purpose. Yes, he had purpose. Be he had purpose before because you can't give him a help meet if he ain't got no meat to help. <laughs> 
right. The, the purpose is to help him meet his responsibility. So if he ain't got no responsibility, he don't need no helper. You don't need no helper. In scripture, uh, Pastor, in Genesis, where it talked about the go and be fruitful, multiply, replenish, all that was the prerequisite of marriage. Yes. Before he brought Adam and Eve together, before he even brought her him out, her out of his rear, out of his side, he already had told him to be fruitful, multiply, repent, exactly. and do the earth. All those things were the prerequisite. And so I'm with you. I'm with you 110% on that. Another thing, and uh, I know our time is running, but um, another thing I wanted to talk about, since I talked about examples of silly and simple-minded, I want to go into some of the things that's hindering us from becoming good men, men of valor, men of virtuous women. Some things that are hindering us is the lack of mentorship. Wow. Major. Uh, I, one of the things that, uh, that we need is we need more people to go back and help others. And we need more people to be open to help of others. We can't have a successor without a mentee. Yes. You can't have anything that's going you're gonna lead to somebody until you have somebody that you impart into. And so, you know, one of the things I learned is that it's not what you leave a person, it's what you leave in a person. Mm. And wow. so what I it's not what I leave my child or what I leave my friends and family, but what did I leave in them? Because they say, you know, the old saying is you can teach a person to or you can feed a person from how to fish and to feed them for a lifetime. That's basically putting something in them. Mm -hmm. Because now they know what to do to keep it going when you can't continue to get it, which all leads to mentorship. And so one of the things that I talk about in the book is that we need our seasoned or experience. It doesn't mean age all the time. It, it could mean experience and have a level of wisdom, godly wisdom. We need them to mentor those that are coming behind us. And that's what this book can be. It could be a mentor. Without me physically being there, it can be your mentor. Another thing uh, that we talk about is uh, moving too fast from singlehood to marriage. Moving too fast from singlehood to marriage is another hindrance from people becoming that man of valor and becoming that virtuous woman versus being the opposite. So my goal is to teach people not to move too fast. Be Self, have a level of self-worth to go to the movie by yourself and watch a movie and not have to have someone take you. Be enough to go to have dinner at a nice restaurant and not have to be with the other uh, with uh, your significant other. I'm happy with me. I'm enjoying this meal. I like the ambiance. I like all that and I'm enjoying it because this is what I enjoy. I saved my own money. I got my savings account. I got my investments got my insurance policy. I'm doing some things that I'm putting stuff in order and I'm not moving too fast from singlehood to marriage. Because when you do that, a lot of times you're doing it because of something you're lacking. And you're trying to gain that by attacking yourself to somebody quick so you can get it from them. But God wanted you to get it by yourself. And then sometimes we as men, and based on our experience with our children and like our, you and I talk about our daughters, we're teaching them I want you to be able to pay your own mortgage. I want you to be able to get your own car. Because if you do happen to find yourself with a situation that's not productive, I don't want you to feel like you have to do silly and simple-minded things to, to stay afloat and stay with somebody that you don't have to stay with. Because what, what you mastered, you can walk away from. But what has mastered you, you can't walk away from. And so I'm trying to make sure that they master certain things that they don't have to stay with something that they don't have to, that God didn't say stay with. So those are a couple of things that I talk about that, that could potentially hinder you from being um, a, a man of valor or a woman of wisdom and a virtuous woman. Um, and, and I'll say a couple more things and then I'll end it and let you go from there, pastors, that, that uh, I talked about another point in my book, I talk about man or beast. Are you a man or a beast? Are you a, uh, when I say a man, I'm talking about somebody of honor. Uh, I'm just talking about, like, that's why I keep mentioning a man of vow. But when I talk about beast, I'm not talking about it from the standpoint that we use in our slang when we say he's a beast because he plays such with such um, uh, pressure and talent. But I'm talking about somebody who's acting in from like an animal and savage. Because sometimes our behaviors are savage savage 
in manner, in action. And I'm like, man, that's not a man that you're acting like. You're acting like a beast. And God didn't create a beast to be able to subdue the earth. He created a man to subdue the earth. The beast, he said, you have charge over. And so that's one of the things I try. Good girls with bad names is another thing that I talk about. And, and I'll end on this one. Is that there's some people that actually are good people. But because of decisions and because either decisions that they made or decisions that was made on them. Now they have certain labels, such as a bad name, that it's hard to get rid of, even though it doesn't represent who they really are. And I've talked to people, I, I work with you uh, much of my career and detention centers and foster care and otherwise I've had all types of stories. And I've seen situations where I've been around as well, where a person they feel like they trust you. A female in particular, I had a situation I know about. She trusted this man or guy at the time, and she felt like she loved him. She was dating him. She had intimacy with him. He videoed her, shared the video with others, and that, because of others seeing that video, attached the label to her. And now, this good person who I know at that time personally, who I know is a good person, now has a label of being a bad girl because of the actions that he took. And yes, she took her part as well in being intimate with him, and she wasn't married. We can talk about all that. And putting that to the side, the thing is, somebody else gave her that label. And years later, I remember a situation, that person came back to an event that I was a part of, and people that were not close to her start whispering. Now, mind you, this is years later. She, at this time, she's married. She got a child, if I'm not mistaken. She's living, got her career or whatever. But they are still talking about her from the standpoint of that label and that situation that happened years before. So when I saw that in, in other experiences, and there's several, I could give lists of them. Those are examples that helped me come up with that title, Good Girls, with bad name because here it is I saw a person that I knew was a good person but now that person had a bad label and a bad name and so I want to help people understand that's why wisdom and discernment and these principles are so important because you understand consequences are more important than decisions that I need to look at who I'm being intimately with and if you're not going to be able to prevent every single thing but trust me if you take uh, the information that's in this book and of course, the principles that's in the word of God, man, you can safeguard yourself from a lot of bad memories and that you can change and you can become who God created you to be. Because the scripture teaches that, um, talks about that as he is, so are we in this world. And so the goal is for you to operate according to how Christ operates. We operate on a standard of being more than enough. We operate from a position of, that uh, more than conquerors. We operate from a position of the head and not the tail. We operate from a position of being a lender and not a borrower. So my goal is to help people say, this is who you really are. If you want a label, these are the labels I want to attach to you. The more than enough label, the head and not the tail label, the healed and not sick label. These are the labels that I'm teaching in the book that these are the ones we're going to attach to you. We all want to have a label at some state in our life, some point. But if I can prevent negative ones, let's prevent them. If I have some negative ones, let's get out of them and let's learn how to get rid of them and get into a new place of life. So again, Pastor, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I hope that what we shared and what you've heard my sharing has been a blessing, not only to you, but those that will watch and are watching us tonight uh, and that will eventually purchase this book. Amen. I mean, you you said some powerful things. Like I said, when you when you talked about the things that help us become better men and that lack of mentorship, I said that's something that's major. You know, one of the things I say, and this is not just men, but but women as well. But I say everybody needs three things in their life. They need a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. Hmm. You got to have a Paul. You got to have somebody pouring into your life. You got to have, if you don't have somebody pouring into your life, then you're not growing. 
If you don't have a Timothy, somebody you're pouring into, then you're selfish. And if you don't have a Barnabas, somebody to keep you accountable, then you're unchecked. Hmm. And like you said, and so many people's lives are out of balance because they don't have the proper relationships. So that's definitely key as far as helping them become, like you said, the, the, the right type of men. Like you said, and you know, you talked about, you know, going from single to being married too soon. You know, we just did this marriage conference. And one of the things we even talked about during that conference is you got to learn that you have to be complete in him. Yes. Because God didn't take two half people and put them together. Mm -hmm. He takes two whole people and blends them to make one. And so if you come in and you're not complete, if you're not whole, then there's already a deficiency. Yes. You're, you're, you're cheating the team. Mm -hmm. Because you're supposed to come together. You're supposed to double. You're supposed to be now a person that's twice as strong as one person. Mm -hmm. And so if you only came in half strength, then like you said, then, then, then you're cheating your whole marriage there. And so one of the things that so many people don't recognize is that the true sign that you're not ready to get married is if you're still selfish. If right. you're still stuck in you because you can't be selfish and be married, the two don't even go together. It doesn't. And, you know, and then you talked about the, the good girls with the bad names. I mean, that's so powerful because so many people don't realize that a good name is to be treasured, you know, yes. more than silver and gold. That's what the scripture tells us. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize the value of your name. Yes. They really don't realize that, you know, and like you say, your decisions can rob you of that. And that's why one of the things I taught, taught my daughters is how to make godly decisions. You know, I gave them five steps to make godly decisions. I said, and you, we got to recognize, I said, because most people, especially young people, make their decisions based on whether or not it's going to be fun or not. Right. Whether or not they're going to enjoy it or not. And that's how we end up in these bad places. I told them, but I said, but if you consider these five things before you make their decision, you'll always make the right choice. Number one, does it honor God? Mm -hmm. Number two, does it honor my parents? Hmm. Number three, how does it affect my future? Mm -hmm. Number four, what does it cost me? Mm. And then number five, is it going to be fun? Right. See, because if you can pass those first four, then we can talk about whether or not it's fun or not. Uh huh. But if I'm making a decision and it's going to affect, it has the potential to derail my future, then that's not a decision I ought to be making. Exactly. If I'm going to dishonor God or dishonor my parents, that's not a decision I should be making. If it's going to cost me more than what I can afford, it's not It's not a decision I should be making. Mm -hmm. But people make decisions, but, oh, that's going to be, oh, come on, it's going to be fun. No, I got to look at everything else before I make that choice. Mm -hmm. Because I go and make that decision because it's fun and I haven't considered the cost. Exactly. And now it ends up destroying parts of my life. It affects my future. And so when we got to learn to make these decisions the right way, because like you said, the choices we make, will affect our name, our reputation. And we've seen it happen so many times before. And like you said, this is an awesome, like I say, it, it, this book is so awesome because it provides those preventative measures as well as restorative measures for those who already made those 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 wrong decisions. But like I said, man, I, I praise God for, for what you shared tonight. I think you've been an awesome blessing to all of the people who, uh, who are watching, like I said, and have watched. What I want you to do now is to tell them about your uh, your your website, how they can find your book, how they can find you, like so how they can get more information because they definitely need to get a hold of that as well as your first book. Like I said, that first book, I told you, it was so powerful. Like I said, we bought copies for the entire church. And like I said, we, we even did a Bible study series on it because it was so powerful. Yes, sir. Thank you again, uh, Pastor. Uh, I can't thank you enough for this opportunity. And I, and I just pray that those that watched and are going to watch uh, the recorded version, that they get what we wanted to give them. Uh, but yes, you can find me. Um, we have a Facebook uh, page. You can uh, inbox me. In, uh, inbox me. Uh, my, you can follow me at JL Sean Claude. That's JL Sean Claude on Facebook. And if you inbox me, you can actually pre-order uh, the book that's coming out. Uh, so what you do is you inbox me, give me your email address. Uh, uh, let me know that you're interested in getting the pre-order version. Uh, those that's going to get the pre-orders, it's not only going to be uh, the book, but it's going to be signed. And I got some other 
gifts that's going to come with it just because you pre-ordered the book. So those who inbox me that way. Also, you can find me on Twitter at Twitter at Dr. Jafef Claude. That's Twitter at D-R-J-A-P-H-E-T-H. -E that's D-R-J-A-P-H-E-T-H -E Claude, C-L-A-U-D-E. Um, uh, my, and my uh, email address, uh, you can email me at 100foldworks at gmail.com. That's 100fold, F-O-L-D, works, W-O-R-K-S, at gmail.com. Uh, so those are just some ways you can find me. My website uh, will be up and running within the next week or so. Uh, had to have some work done to it with the new book and everything that we're doing. And that's going, the website address is going to be www.100foldworks.com. That's www100 foldworks.com. Again, uh, pr uh, that will be up within the next week or so. Uh, and that'll have all the other information that I just shared on the website. And again, my current book that I have, as you showed, is um, Do You See What I'm Saying? The Journey to Your Destiny Through Vision and the Spoken Word. That is available on all the bookstores, uh, Barnes & Noble, Google, um, Zulon Press, or you can get it directly from me if you would like a signed copy. If you want a signed copy, you can do the same thing by uh, sending me a, a message in my uh, inbox on Facebook or email me and we'll be able to get that to you right away. Amen. Well, praise God, man. We're so excited. You know I need four copies because I need two for my girls and me and Pastor Stephanie got to have our own because we don't share books. We, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we both like to highlight our own and, you know, we, we love books. So like I so I need, I need four copies. So you already got me down for my four copies. Yes, sir. We're going to make I, that happen. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting on mine. But like yeah. I said, man, I'm telling you, we, we are so blessed, man. And so glad to be able to have you come and share this tonight. Cause I'm telling you, I know some people have been blessed and I'm so excited. Like I said, about what God is doing, like I said, with this ministry, man, because so many people, have struggled with this and are struggling with this. And this is going to deliver a lot of people. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Pastor. And I look forward to coming back with you soon. I mean, we just touched the, the surface. Uh, we didn't even get as deep as we could have gotten in some of the information in, that's in this book and that God has laid on my heart. And I, I like how we did it, Pastor, uh, how we flowed back and forth uh, because just as much as I felt like God was leading me to give, God led you to give. And so I know the people of God just was blessed twofold, you know? Uh, so I, I do appreciate you. Yes, Amen. Sir. Well, praise God. I want you all to stay tuned for, for our announcements. And we bless you all this evening. Come back and see us again on next Thursday. Are you looking for dynamic teaching, spirit-filled worship, and an opportunity to experience the love of God? See, every gift we receive from God is a result of His grace. And God has an expectation that we use those gifts to benefit one another. We all have flaws, things that make us not so easy to deal with. He says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. See, we don't always feel like treating each other right. But love allows us to do so without complaining. Tell your neighbor, in order to imitate the love of God, you've got to be willing to give yourself up. You can now watch the My Church broadcast on your Roku, and Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Simply download the Boxcast channel and look for the My Church icon. Or catch the word on the go with the word at My Church Podcast. Now available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play Music. Tune in iHeartRadio, Pandora, and Stitcher Podcast platforms. Just search for My Church Lynchburg. Now there's no excuse to go without the word. 
And for those of you with Alexa enabled devices, simply enable the My Church Lynchburg skill in the Alexa app. Then say, Alexa, open My Church Lynchburg and sit back and enjoy the word. For a more interactive worship environment, join our online congregation at www.watchmychurchonline.org. You can also subscribe to the My Church Lynchburg YouTube page for weekly sermon updates. And don't forget to follow us on social media.